Hello, Pat Love from Love Healing Hearts, here to read a little scripture backed by Pat's two cents. Yeah, we're getting back in the saddle, y'all. Get back to business. All right, Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body than remnant? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into bonds, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubic to his stature? And why take ye thought for remnant? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore of God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Well, that was the end of the chapter, verse 34. Now, what I want to share is I want to share two testimonies that happened when I was all up in arms, and that just happens to be my nature. When we first moved here, where the Lord brought us, I'm talking about me and my, my late husband. When we first moved here, our backs were up against the wall the whole time. The whole process was nerve-wracking. But we could see God showing us a way of escape. And he had already told us he was going to give us, he was going to choose our inheritance for us. So staying in the center of God's will, let me give you two, two flip sides of that, so bear with me. Staying in the center of God's will caused us to be blessed tremendously. But it was hell on wheels getting to the blessing, right? And not the way it is sometimes. Well, for those of you who are really going through it in your family life and your, your housing, your whole situation, your job, listen to this. When I first moved here, it was a bank-owned house. Now, I got my husband situated, got me situated, everything was right, had his bed bedroom all set up with hospital equipment. All that was taken care of by Medi-Cal. But I had a dilemma in my front yard. And that dilemma was a great big old, I would say, 60 foot tall or 80 foot tall pine tree. That bad boy is a tall mamma jamma. Okay. It had branches hanging all over the neighbor's house, our house. Well, that wasn't our fault. We moved into this situation. So I looked at it, knowing that the HOA wanted us to do something about it as soon as we got in the house. And I said, Lord, I know they're going to give us a little time, but we need some money because that tree is going to cost at least 
yeah, to not only trim, but carry and, and uh, what's the word, to haul away all those old branches, right? So I'm thinking about that expense. Then a year later, I have another issue on my hands. The Lord warns me in my spirit that sooner or later, sooner more than later, they're going to cause all of us, force all of us to tow away our cars or get rid of them before they tow them away. And I had a car that was not functioning anymore and I didn't have the money to get it fixed or to maintain it. Well, that was actually two years later. First miracle, three guys, two I had never met before. One happened to be at one of the churches my husband and I visited several times trying to figure out which church to go to. This was a Seventh-day Adventist church. We had started going to church on Sabbath. We were Sunday church people, but we wanted to switch up because there were promises associated with observing the Sabbath. Isaiah 58, if you want to know. So I said, Lord, I'll cut a deal with you. The Lord is blessed so far. But listen, so what ended up happening was the tree was getting to be a real nuisance. And this guy from the church introduced himself to us. And he took a liking to Milton and he came over and visited him a few times. And this was the miracle. When I told him, I asked him if he knew any people who knew how to work on trees, because that is a big deal with us. And it was going to be a major issue if we didn't get that taken care of. He told me he knew two men who worked on trees. He could hire them. Check this out. Remember I said how much it would cost? I had already looked into it. He said, if $100 won't break you, I'll get the tree. I'll, I'll get all those bad limbs off, cut them up in pieces, and haul them away for $100. Miracle number one. Miracle number two. Now, my husband had passed away October, 3rd, October 19th, 2013. And my car died a month later. It was raining. I couldn't, you know, it just all of a sudden cut off on me and I was barely getting it in to park it in front of the house. What ended up happening was four months later, as it sat, because I wasn't going to move it. The Lord told me it was the catalytic converter. Now, I didn't know catalytic converter from the carburetor, but that's what the Lord told me. And when I asked my husband's friend who had come up here to visit his buddy to come look at my car, his brother came with him. They looked at it and said, oh, we'll start it up. See if it starts. I was afraid to do that. It started right up. And he said, you know what happened? It was the catalytic converter. It got wet in the rainy season. I mean, God will walk you through some crazy things when you don't know what the heck is going on. He'll tell you and he'll solve the problem. And this is what happened. His brother who lived in Arizona, was out here visiting, rode up here with him and offered me, said, how much, uh, how much would you take for the car? I want to buy it. And it was right at the time when God had told me within a month or so, they're going to start forcing all these people to get rid of these cars. So you better do something. Now, I knew that with my income being so low, I could not afford to even maintain the insurance, let alone the gas. And this baby was a gas guzzler. So, and that car is a miracle. I'll tell you that on another story. My first brand new car. Well, at this time, it was 10 or 11 years old and it was ready. 
So he paid me for the car, drove the car to Pasadena. We got all the tags situated. And he was able to drive that car all the way to Arizona without incident. So I tell you, when I say God can solve your problems without you, I mean, I knew. I had a next door neighbor who was saying, I want to buy your car. I want to buy your car. I want to buy your car. But he never had the money. And I gave him till a certain date. And when that date was up, I dialed and said, okay. The car is up and ready to be sold because the neighbor didn't come through. And they came up with cash in hand and paid for my car. And we got the tags and everything situated. And, and two weeks after the car was gone, I got a notice in the mail saying, all cars need to be off the premises if they're not operating. They need to be off the premises within two weeks or we will have them towed away. I knew it. I knew I had heard from God about that car. Now, I had never put a for sale sign up on my, listen, never put a for sale sign up. I never did that. On top of that, the one that I was hoping would buy it, never did buy it. Now, I didn't know this guy, he was in Arizona and God brought him right at the nick of time and he had the money. I'm telling you, when something is meant for you, when, when, when you're in a dilemma and you can't seem to wiggle your way, slick your way, slide your way, or lie your way out of it, God, he got some tricks up his sleeve too. And his timing is always right on. I'm telling you. So I said all that to say, Trust God. The old folks used to say, honey, he's due to trust. Trust God in every situation and all the stuff you can't do anything about. Trust him. If you ask and you listen, you'll start picking up signals. You'll start getting little impressions of the time, the window, the uh. Uh, uh, what do they call it? The window of time that you have. You will know just about when it's time to do this or do that. And you'll always be on time. I mean, when I got that thing in the mail, it was like a two-week notice. They all had to be gone. My car was sold and out of the way. So all I want to say is trust God to provide the people. See, the thing is, we were, even though we weren't a member of a church and we didn't know anybody out here, but my brother who didn't go to church, we were running around trying to find a church body. We were staying connected even with people we didn't know. And it was the people we didn't know that ended up being the blessings. All these people that I talked about involved in both of these stories, they're all born again Christians. Tell me, you can't, you can't debate with me and convince me you don't need to be with the pack. You need to stay connected with the body of Christ. I don't care if it's, if it's Pentecostal, Baptist, uh, Seventh-day Adventist, Church of God, Church of God in Christ. We need the body. Do you hear me? All right. Mother has spoken. That's enough of Pat's two cents for one night. God bless you. You can see I'm feeling my Cheerios again. God bless you. For those of you young ones who don't know what that means, ask your mom and papa. I'm feeling my Cheerios. <laughs> God bless you.